Hi everyone, it's Alex here at Sestrian Capital Research. Welcome to our Inner Circle Morning Show. This is being recorded on the evening of Sunday the 14th of May in preparation for the market on open on the Monday the 15th of May. We'll do a quick one today. Uh, so we'll do our usual disclaimer in a moment and then I just want to run through the equity indices, uh, usual longer and shorter term charts, uh, touch on Bitcoin and Ether and then we'll wrap up. So just a, a quick start to the week. And um, let's get going with our disclaimer we have right here. So disclaimer, this webinar is intended for US recipients only and in particular is not directed at nor intended to be relied upon by any UK recipients. Any information or analysis in this webinar is not an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any securities. Nothing in this webinar is intended to be investment advice and nor should it be relied upon to make investment decisions. Session Capital Research, its employees, agents or affiliates, including the presenter of this webinar or related persons, may have a position in any stock, securities or financial instruments referenced in the webinar. Any opinions, analyses or probabilities expressed in the webinar are those of the presenter as of the webinar's date of transmission and are subject to change without notice. Companies referenced in the webinar or their employees or affiliates may be customers of Sestrian Capital Research. Sestrian Capital Research values both its independence and transparency and does not believe this presents a material potential conflict of interest or impacts the content of its research or publications. Okay, so let's cut to the chase. So let's go straight to our equity indices. So let's start with the S&P. Now, as you know, uh, this is the, uh, we use the, the SPY ETF to track the uh, longer term movements on the S&P 500. So if you're new here, and many are, just to run you through. So this is a, a longer term chart of the, of the SPY ETF. It's a weekly chart. And what you're seeing here is a five wave up pattern, which we've started back at the 2015 lows. And this follows a, a really nice technical pattern that moves up to a wave one high uh, just before the coronavirus crisis. So over the course of about four and a half, five years, it moves up from about $181 a share to about $340. So more or less a double. It drops uh, a, a, a big drop, nearly, nearly the 78.6 Fibonacci retracement. So it drops you know, almost 80% of the value that it created in four or five years in the space of a month or two. Um, that's what a wave two will often look like. And then fueled by two things, number one, a flood of federal liquidity, and number two, a reversal in heavily bearish Q1 options. Uh, we get this big, big, big uh, momentum run up, a wave three up, that peaks at uh, the end of December 2021. And although we all think this was a colossal market run, it wasn't really. It, it, this is a, a standard wave three higher, 1.618 Fibonacci extension of the prior wave one. Uh, we then get uh, 2022 sell off, which was again almost a perfect technical sell off. So it drops to this wave four low, which is around a 0.5 retracement of this wave three up. And importantly, the wave four low, which is right let's grab hold of this let's do this which is just right here at this 350 level on the s p on the spy just above that wave one high so that's a a, a technically classic uh, wave four low position two ways to look at where we are now you can either say and this is our house view that we're in a wave five up and that this wave five should conclude sometime in the next year or two I have to say this this Fibonacci wave method is not so good on the x-axis. It's not bad on the y-axis, the prices, but on timing, it's not as accurate in my experience. Uh, but this wave five up, if one is bullish, we are, ought to conclude somewhere between the 61.8 and the 78.6 extension of that wave one and three combined. And that sounds hard, it isn't. You just take the price move from the bottom of the wave one, so that's 181, up to the top of the wave three, call it 480, uh, for the sake of argument, and then multiply that by 0 0.618 or 0 0.786, add that number to the wave four low. So it's not very complicated, really. All of this technical analysis is just pattern recognition. And all you're looking for in any technical analysis is to find patterns, a language that the market speaks, and very specifically a language that is used by large account players. And if you can find that language, be it in the shorter term or longer term, then you have a chance of uh, predicting to some degree, where the market's going to go over your chosen time frame. Of course, it's just a game of probabilities. There's no um, real science to it. All you're looking for is how is it the large accounts behave? Can I find a, the, the method? Can I find that pattern? And if so, can I tag along large accounts coattails? 
So two ways to look at the S&P right now. We're either in a wave five up, and, and we think that we are, that's a house opinion. So we're expecting a peak in the, let's call it somewhere between 530 and 580, probably if I had to guess, near a 530. Uh, and that's moving up quite nicely, big move up since the October lows, another push up since the uh, December and then March lows. Um, the other perspective, though, is that we're just in a sideways zone. And save for a couple of spikes up and down, we've been sideways for 12 months now. now so May last year, we entered this sideways box at about SPY 420. There's a floor here around 380. Yeah, it did spike down here in June and again in October, but but not very much. And you can see from the volume uh, by price chart over on the right here it's not much volume down here in, in this spike so the clock for these gray bars here starts at the all-time high this is buying and selling since the all-time high and so you can see that as the spy plunged here although you know it's Armageddon according to Twitter there's no volume down there and as always selling stopped when there was no more sellers uh, at which point you get this bounce up so the question right now with the S&P is when will it break from this what we view as an accumulation sideways range. We believe this is large account players accumulating the S&P over time, of course, of a year now in anticipation of a move up. Uh, we have a new higher inflation, higher rates environment. I think the consensus is probably that inflation is going to cool. The CME futures data will tell you that the Fed's expected to that they are expecting the Fed to cut rates over the course of the next 12 months, um, and so probably uh, there's some accuracy in that and probably what you have here is large account players building up quiet long positions in anticipation uh, of those two things if we were to look at the shorter term s p shorter term we're a little more bearish uh on a day by day time frame so here we use the es futures this is um an artificial construct really used by trading view it's it's a it's a mocked up continuous contract but it's useful for analytics uh, if nothing else. So here, the S&P is struggling with this uh, 42.10 top that it's hit on the futures in uh, December, again in February, tested it in, didn't quite get there in April, again in early May, and every time it gets up here, it's rejected. So if we're going to break out of that consolidation zone we looked at at the moment ago, it has to break through this red line here and turn that red line into support. Now, we do think that's going to happen, um, but we house view again expect a little bit of weakness before um, that turning into strength so i think we're cautious on the s p right now short term bullish over the course of the next few months year 18 months but short term just cautious and careful let's move on to the nasdaq so let's use the qqq etf for the nasdaq now uh, in the nasdaq everything happens faster and with more amplitude than the S&P. And so what you have here is a, is a pretty similar chart really to the S&P um, longer term, but it's a truncated time frame and it's an expanded price amplitude. I'll show you what we mean by that. So with the S&P, uh, we'd started in the 2015 lows uh, and we showed that it more or less doubled uh, going into the pre-COVID highs. Well, NASDAQ here, we, we bottom out in the end of 2018. And there's a good reason for that, which is uh, the Federal Reserve reversed course at this point. So through 2018, there'd been talk of quantitative tightening, uh, monetary policy tightening in general. Uh, that reversed at the end of 2018 under the normal level of political pressure from the administration. You know, all administrations pressure the Fed into these things. The current administration does, the prior administration did, all administrations do it. And then well, that resulted in a reversal at the end of 2018. 2019, so a loosening of monetary policy. And you got this rip up in the nasdaq as a result from 143 dollars a share on the qqq to about 240 on the qqq within the space of um just over a year uh, and you can say that earnings were good and they were they were fine but that's not that's not earnings supported that's monetary policy loosening that's cost of money going down amount of money available going up liquidity we then get uh, a 78.6 fib retracement almost at the dollar again uh here we lose uh what 18 months gains uh of actually 16 months gains uh, in the space of a month. So a dramatic wave two drop. And then again, we get the Q1 options expire in reversal. At that point, market makers have to rebalance their equity positioning from um, bearish to bullish. Uh, bearish because they've they've sold uh, put options 
to uh, put buyers. So investors had bought puts in order to protect themselves in their own minds. Uh, market makers had sold puts. So in other words, they were long the market in order to remain delta neutral. They have to take a corresponding short position in equities or futures to maintain their delta neutral position. Once those puts expire, and they did many worthless, um, the market maker is in that moment is has a um, a short exposure, and so they have to cover that by buying long. And so the combination of a flood of federal liquidity and market maker short covering kicked off a big momentum trend here. And as the federal liquidity continued, the Nasdaq moved up a big way through all through 2020 and 21, peaked at the end of November 21 at a 2.618 extension of that wave one back there. So it's a big wave three. If you remember the wave three in the S&P was a 1.618 extension, Nasdaq 2.618. So that's a big that's a big move up. We got wave four down again in 2022, um, a 61.8 reversal here versus a 0.5 in the SPY. Again, wave four thinks about breaking the wave one high. It doesn't, but it thinks about it. And then um, NASDAQ's pretty interesting. So it, it bottoms out really convincingly. So you get a bottom in October, retested in October at the end, retested in December, retested in January, and it's shot up since then. So, you know, although there's plenty of doom and gloom around, you know, you'd have to find some pretty good reasons, I think, to uh, believes that the Nasdaq is going to retest these October lows. You know, earnings in Q1, as in the Q4 earnings reported in Q1, pretty terrible. The market moved up anyway. Q1 earnings reported in Q2 have been better. Some good, some bad, but better and better than expected. And that's propelled a further move up in the Nasdaq. Now, long term, short term again. Um, long term, as in the next 12, 24 months, we're bullish on the NASDAQ. Again, same logic. We think we're going to wave five up. We think that wave five will terminate somewhere between the 61.8 and the 78.6 extension of wave one to three combined. That puts the QQQ peaking somewhere between 420 and 460. Again, we'd guess near the lower end. Um, but short term, uh, mixed, I'd say. On the QQQ, I think you can make a bullish argument, to be honest, because it's turned this 315 level, the 38.2 retrace of wave three into support. Look, it did it here kind of in April, here kind of in April again, here kind of end of April, here convincingly at the end of April, and then last week's trading stayed well above that level. There's probably some resistance coming up around 330 by the looks of things, um, but look, that's a that's a bullish move. So if you look at this chart alone, it's easy to be bullish on the Nasdaq. If you look at the shorter term chart, and again we use the NQ futures for this, then slightly different story, I would say. So this is a four-hour chart right here, and the, the the key level to watch here is around 13. Uh, 360, 13, 370 on the futures. And, and look, here's what's happening. This is the move up from the January lows. So we get a one up, a two down, a big wave three up, a two, nearly a 3.236 extension, an ABC correction, four, wave four down, 61.8 retrace for the wave four down, and the wave five up that peaks. Look, um, thus far, let's call that the wave five peak. Just between the 61.8 and the 78.6 extension of wave one and three combined. And it's just below that 78.6 extension right now. And then it, it almost hit that and then sold off again. So this level here, this red line here, unless the NQ futures turn that into support and convincingly so, then I would say there's some short term weakness due in the NASDAQ. The move up off the January lows has been dramatic. And you know stocks don't go up in one direction and stay there. So no, no question here. House view bullish on the Nasdaq, medium to long term. Short term, again, push it. We if you had to push us, you, we'd say probably a bit of weakness before the strength kicks in. Um, let's do the Dow and the Russell. This is the DIA ETF for the Dow. Um, we can be short on this one. So here's your wave three high at the end of uh, 21. A muted wave three high, only a 1.236 extension of the prior wave one. It's common with the Dow. You get a lot of the downside of the S&P and the Nasdaq, but not as much of the upside. You get a wave four down, um, which actually dropped just below that wave one high. So that was a real big sell-off for the Dow. Um, it made it like a scalded cat in uh, September, October, moved up, hit this uh, 
post sell off high of about 343 on the DIA and has struggled to really beat that ever since. It got there again at the end of April, but until it turns its 343 level into support again, we do think there's a wave five up here. We on similar parameters that puts the DIA peaking around 420, maybe a bit higher, but it must push through this 345 level first in order to get there. Um, again, if you were going to argue that the Dow was going to crash, you'd have to say, well, last time it was down here, there, there were no more sellers by the time we hit 285 on the DIA. And you can see the volume again, all the volume here is after the all time high. The volume just plummets away. Where there's a lot of volume is in this price range now. Again, this looks like accumulation. So we do expect it to break up and out, but perhaps not tomorrow. Uh, let's do the Dow short term. So this is the YM futures. And um, it's a bit of a mess, this, but, but it, it, it does work really well. It's, it's working to technicals very nicely indeed. So from the March lows, this is, we get a wave one up and a two down, a 78.6 retrace, a wave three up, 1.618, wave three up, perfect. And then we get, this is really interesting, Pat. Um, well, I, I, interesting if you like stock charts. The B waves are awful things that they'll freak you out. They'll convince you that um, the bear has turned bull and then they'll take all your money off you. So we get this wave three down, heading into this wave four down and you get this A, B, C form. A down, B up, C down. But look, the B wave peaks above that wave three high. But so it's easy to think, oh, we're in a wave five up now, but we're not. It's an A, B, C down. You be really, really careful when you see these A, B, C corrections. The B waves will convince you. Uh, this happened in the SPY in August 22. Um, it will convince you that there's a new high on the way and an all-time high on the way, but not so. C then correction down here. And then we've started uh, a, a new cycle up in the YM futures. So what we have here is um succeeding grabbing this not, is a wave one up and a wave two down and this two down here down into the may lows look it's a 78.6 retrace from the start of this wave one it's a perfect wave two so we would expect the next move up in the dow to be a, a wave three up in the ym futures back up again to this ceiling it keeps hitting so short term um very short term bullish on the dow but it, it's got to get up and above this ceiling that we saw in the long term chart Lastly, the Russell, Russell 2000 IWM. Now we're charting this in a slightly different way. Um, as you'll know, if you watch our work, we use this Wyckoff cycle rotation motif a lot. And the, the Russell 2000 has exhibited this really, really well. So um, we had this pre-COVID period and through COVID, so 2017, 2018, sideways accumulation action. Um, there's a COVID crisis sell-off down here, but if we were to chart the volume here, you'd see it's almost nothing. In comes the federal liquidity, reversal goes the uh, Q and options, and then, then the, the Russell moons, rips up through this markup zone very quickly, and then gets into this distribution zone up here where big accounts are selling here. Retail is buying because look, it's the middle of 2021, everyone thinks that it's gonna go to the moon forever. This is uh, large account players getting exit liquidity by selling to retail, simple as that. Then we get this markdown period, and now we're back in accumulation. What we have now is fearful retail selling to institutions. You've got big volume down here. You can see this again, these gray bars um, start from the all time high here. Um, and so again, we believe this is accumulation and anticipation of a markup. There's a lot of chat about the Russell now and how bad it is because it's got um, financial exposure. But look, since the uh, September lows, the lows that have been struck are all higher lows. This is this sloping up green bar here. So this is the low in September. This is low in March, higher, low in April, higher, and so far higher. So we'll see, but this looks like accumulation um, in readiness for a, a substantial move up uh, towards the end of the year and next year. If we look at the futures, RTY, um, looks like we are probably in an up move now. So for our chart again, this is the lows in the end of March, wave one up, wave two down, almost, almost to the bottom of this original wave one up, but doesn't shed it all. And we're probably now moving in a wave three up, probably. Uh, perhaps this retests the lows and tries again, but 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 we would expect some strength in the Russell to come through. Um, in, on the longer term chart, it's just bumbling along the bottom of this accumulation zone. So it could do that for a bit longer, but we do expect this to, to move up. 
Lastly, to finish off, let's look at um, uh, crypto futures. Uh, so if we were to look at where we closed on Friday, so crypto futures not started trading yet. Uh, this is the this is Bitcoin futures, and this is from the lows in November. So we get a wave one up, a two down, just shy of a 78.6 retrace, a wave three up, uh, 2.618 extension, wave three, 61.8 retrace into wave four, and a big wave five that peaks right up here. We then in, it looks to us like we're in an ABC correction now. So A down, B up, C down. And so we would expect this C down to reach, I don't know, 25,000, maybe maybe less. We think there's some weakness in Bitcoin. You've got problems with Binance, problem with Coinbase, um, problems with Coinbase. And all in all, although most likely Bitcoin survives all of this and ends up in a different institutional setting in our view, um, problems in the plumbing right now, I think we'll hit the price. Ether, um, probably a derivative of Bitcoin in the end, uh, but has traded again since, since the November lows, one up, two down, big three up here. And then we are probably in a wave four down now, which will probably retest this wave one high. So we could see Ether drop to 1500 ish. It's been up to 2100 as high as that. Um, we would expect that to recover and then get up to maybe 2,600 and 1.618 extension of that prior wave one. So with both Bitcoin and Ether, not with the same conviction as the S&P and the NASDAQ, I would say, but our house view is, look, there's going to be some problems whilst Binance, Coinbase, all these things, all these problems work their way through. In the end, we believe that at least for the top two coins, Bitcoin and Ether, they'll be treated as securities by the SEC and they'll be fed through the same financial plumbing uh, that securities are. And so if you roll forward a couple of years, we would think that all of the same market makers that are happily making money from the S&P and the NASDAQ will make money from Bitcoin and Ether, um, both in their uh, native security and futures and no doubt options at the time. But whilst uh, these things are growing up, we would expect some, some short term pain. OK, folks, well, that's been uh, our Inner Circle morning show for the day. Again, recorded uh, evening of Sunday, the 14th of May in preparation for the market to be opening on the Monday, the 15th of May. Um, as always, uh, post any questions you like in uh, comments of this article or you can email me directly uh, or use our Inner Circle Slack channel. Uh, sign up for that if you haven't done already. There's an invite in your inbox uh, and you can use that to communicate both with uh, myself and other folks at Sestrian and uh, also anyone else in the group here in a circle that's interested. I'll have to say the, the, the group here is by its own choice, not the chattiest, um, but do use Slack if you, um, if, you, if you feel like you want to. So thanks everyone for being a subscriber here. Look forward to whatever the market brings us this week. And thanks for watching the morning show.